everything is going to hell down here in Texas. Man, if that don't get you fired up for the show, I don't know what will. Ah, please. Once again, thank you, Roger and Shepard of Fire, for that absolutely fire-ass intro. This is your boy, the Triple B, Big Bad Bob, otherwise known as Rob Clark, here with you. This is the Lone Gunman Podcast, and you are buckled in for another exciting episode. Today, we're going to be talking about a very intriguing composition. You know, sometimes you run across things in the course of your research that you think, you know what? This might be a smoking gun. This might be the smoke, you know, from which, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm totally butchering this euphemism, but you get the point. Where there's smoke, there's fire. And I believe that there was some fire on November the 22nd, 1963. And I promise we'll get there. Just hang in there with me. Um, First off, I want to say happy Memorial Day weekend to everyone out there. And a special thank you to those who have served our illustrious and beautiful and and, uh, what some would call maybe corrupt now uh, country. And I believe part of researching into the Kennedy assassination is every one of us that does this, there's just that nugget of patriotism, uh, you know, stuck within our soul, you know, when we had uh, possibly one of the the greatest presidents of all time struck down on a street in broad daylight in Dallas, Texas on November the 22nd, 1963. So I just wanted to get that out there. Once again, happy Memorial Day and a special thank you to those who have served our country. We do appreciate it. Now let's hear a word from our sponsor. Big Bad Bob here with you for Silk City Hot Sauces. Why Silk City? Because this hot sauce comes to you directly from Patterson, New Jersey, also known as Silk City. These hot sauces are 100% natural, gluten-free, vegan, contain no chemicals, fillers, dyes, or junk. Everything is packed into recyclable glass containers because glass doesn't leach weird flavors into the product. All other hot sauces are sourced in small batches from locally bought fresh peppers. It's all about the pepper, people. Telling you. Your boy, Big Bad Bob, loves his food. Like he loves his women. Hot and spicy. But not so hot. You can't eat them. (laughs) So. If you love yourself some sauce. And you're tired. Of trying to transform. Your bland meat. Into something edible. With the tip of a jar. You will transform your life forever. Head over to. SilkCityHotSauce.com Place an order. And upon checkout, enter the code GUNMAN, that's G-U-N-M-A-N, for 20% off of your entire order. You won't regret it. Thank me later. Peace. So yeah, if you want to be like listeners Joe and Johnny, who have already gotten some hot sauce from Silk City, they've already written me, they tell me they got it, they loved it. So if you'd like to join the Hot Sauce Army and support the show, uh, it'd be much appreciated. Um, Do yourself a favor and add some flavor to your life. 
head over to SilkCityHotSauce.com, put an order in, and upon checkout, enter the code GUNMAN, that's G-U-N-M-A-N, for 20% off an entire order. All right, so let's get to the meat of the issue here today. Um, in the course of investigating Lee Harvey Oswald on November the 22nd, 1963, we've run into several problems with the official story. Okay. And I believe the Warren Commission realized this as well. So on March the 8th, 1964, I got a memorandum here. Uh, from Norman Redlick, and this is to Mr. Misters Ball, Beelan, Hubert, Griffin, and Stern, all Warren Commission uh, Junior Council. There seems to be considerable uncertainty as to the precise lead which caused the Dallas police to go to Oswald's rooming house at 1026 North Beckley. Mr. Hubert and Griffin have expressed interest because of the possible implication of Mrs. Roberts. Mr. Stern and I should be concerned with this in our investigation into the FBI's prior contact with Oswald. We have attempted to discover whether the FBI knew where Oswald was living. It is interesting to note that on page 165 of the DPD report, uh, commission number 81B, Captain Fritz directed various police officers to proceed to the Payne home and to 1026 North Beckley at precisely the same time, 2.30 p.m. The police report does not indicate how Fritz was aware that Oswald was living there. If the police officers had not yet reached the Paynes by 2.30, then it would appear that the lead to 1026 North Beckley would have had to come from some other source other than Ruth Payne. The first interrogation of Oswald occurred at 2.20 p.m., according to Dallas Police Report, page 165, commission number 81B. Present at this interrogation were FBI agents Bookout and Hosty. One possible source of Oswald's Beckley Street address could have been the FBI agents. Another possible source might have been Mrs. Roberts, who might have seen Oswald's picture on television, but apparently she didn't identify Oswald until after the police reached her house, at which time she saw a picture of Oswald on television and identified him as O.H. Lee. According to a report appearing in Agent Jimberling's report of November 30th, Mr. A.C. Johnson, the owner of 1026 North Beckley, advised the FBI that he had just seen on television a person known to him as O.H. Lee, but was identified on television as Lee Oswald. Johnson apparently notified the FBI to this effect on November the 22nd, but we do not know the time. I would think it extremely unlikely that Oswald's picture was on television prior to 2.30. If this is so, then the lead which directed the police to the rooming house could not have come from Johnson's call. I would like to receive any information any of you have concerning this point. All right, so they got a problem. Okay. At 2.40 p.m., W.E. Potts, B.L. Senkel, and Lieutenant Cunningham were dispatched to 1026 North Beckley. Potts wrote in his after-action report uh, that after he finished taking some affidavits, Fritz dispatched them to the Beckley Street address at 2.40, and they arrived at Beckley at 3 p.m. Detective Sinkel also said in his after-action report that they arrived at 1026 North Beckley at 3 p.m. Now, pretty, pretty quickly, they had established um, that Oswald had been 
staying or had the address uh, when he filled out the, uh, what do they call it, application for employment. He put down 2515 West Fifth Street, Irving, Texas, which is Ruth Payne's address. So officers were actually dispatched to Irving first. But because of the 40 minute wait at the Irving address, the police actually arrived at Beckley before the Irving address had even been searched. According to uh, the responding officers, they did not search the room on Beckley until Detective Turner, David Johnston, and Deputy DA Bill Alexander arrived with a search warrant at 4.30 or 5 p.m. So if the police had already been at Beckley for 30 minutes before they began the search at Irving to find a telephone number that they crisscrossed, how did they know about the Beckley rooming house address? <laughs> so it gets, it, it, we get into some very convoluted things here. So what they're referring to there is that allegedly there was some things said um, that after responding to Ruth Payne's address and talking to Ruth Payne, the, the detectives were given the number, the phone number, where they could reach Lee Harvey Oswald. Now, they didn't have his address, Ruth Payne or Marina. And they said that they quite simply were given this phone number and that they, they crisscrossed uh, the phone number, searched it, and it came up with the address of 1026 North Beckley. But if they were dispatched to Irving and Beckley at the same time, and officers were at Beckley for 30 or 40 minutes before officers even got to Irving and talked to them and, and searched and, and found things, then how in the hell did they originally come up with the fact that Lee Harvey Oswald was staying at the 1026 North Beckley address? Well, according to Erlene Roberts, who was the landlady, uh, she was first interviewed briefly on November 22nd, sometime after 2.30, 3 p.m. by the responding officers. She stated she was watching TV when a man known to her as O.H. Lee came into the rooming house, got a coat from his room, and left. He said he was identical to Oswald when she later saw on TV on November 22nd. She gave a more detailed statement on November 27th and produced a sheet of paper, which she says Oswald, Oswald wrote the name O.H. Lee, and she used it to maintain a record of rental payments. So Erlene Roberts stating that... Uh, Sometime after 2.30 or 3, she stated she was watching, or I mean, this is when she states she was interviewed um, briefly, sorry, 2.30 or 3 o'clock. Um, On November the 29th, Mrs. Roberts stated that she had seen a police car, number 207, drive slowly past 1026 North Beckley while Oswald was in his room changing clothes. On November the 22nd, it blew its horn and then proceeded towards Zang's Boulevard. So it would appear that somebody in the DPD knew where Oswald was staying. You know what I'm saying? Um, now, we have a handwritten statement from Erlene Roberts taken on November the 22nd. I'm sorry, the fifth day, December 5, 1963. I, Erlene Roberts, after being duly sworn 
do depose in state. I live at 1026 Beckley, Dallas, Texas, where I serve as a housekeeper for a rooming house owned by Mr. and Mrs. A.C. Johnson. On Friday, November 22nd, 1963, at approximately 1 p.m., I was sitting in the living room watching TV about the president assassination when a man I knew as O.H. Lee, but who has since been identified as Lee Harvey Oswald, came into the front door and went to his room. Oswald did not have a jacket when he came in the house, and I didn't recall what type of clothing he was wearing. Oswald went to his room and was only there a few minutes before coming out. I noticed he had a jacket he was putting on. I recall the jacket was a dark color, and it was the type that zips up the front. He was gripping the pocket, or he was zipping the jacket up as he left. All right, first of all, doesn't quite match the... Uh, Light colored gray jacket that was found after the scene of the Tippet assassin or Tippet killing. I recall the jacket was a dark color. Hmm. Oswald went out the front door. A moment later, I looked out the window. I saw Lee Oswald standing at the curb at the bus stop, just to the right and on the same side of the street as our home. I just glanced out the window that once. So I don't know how long Lee Oswald stood at the curb, nor did I see which direction he went when he left there. About 30 minutes later, let me, re <laughs> let me reiterate that. About 30 minutes later, and this is after Lee Oswald came in the door and left at 105. 30 minutes later, three Dallas policemen came to the house looking for Lee Harvey Oswald. We didn't know who Lee Harvey Oswald was until sometime later his picture was flashed on television. I then let the Dallas policemen in the room occupied by Lee Oswald. While the Dallas police were searching the room, two FBI agents came in. The police and FBI agents took everything in the room that belonged to Lee Oswald and also took our pillow case and two towels and washcloths. I have made this statement consisting of three pages to Special Agent William Court Carter and Arthur Blake of the U.S. Secret Service. I have read this statement over and I find it to be true to the best of my knowledge, Erlene Roberts. All right, so a couple interesting things there, folks. <laughs> the official story, okay, has nobody searching this rooming house until Detective Turner, Detective Johnson. And Deputy DA Bill Alexander arrived with a search warrant at 4.30 or 5 p.m. What Erlene Roberts just told you, under oath, to the best of her ability in her Secret Service statement, is that uh, 30 minutes after Lee Oswald walked back out that front door, Three Dallas police came in, they talked to them, and she let them search the room. And while they were searching the room, two FBI agents come in and take everything. Take everything out of the room, including towels and washcloths and curtains. And this would be all before Oswald had even been arrested at the Texas Theater. Or right about since the same time. I mean, you figure a half an hour after 105, 135, 140, that's when Oswald was arrested at the theater. 
They hadn't even gotten him down to the damn station yet. They hadn't interrogated him yet. So how did they know to go to 1026 North Beckley? How? How could they have possibly known? Why the smoke and mirrors? If by this time, if before 2 o'clock even happens, before the officers even had gotten to Irving, the DPD and the FBI had already been there and searched and took everything out of there. And then they show up two hours later with a search warrant. Something definitely smells a little fishy. And the reason I'm paying a little more credence to this statement from Erlene Roberts is because it wasn't given to the DPD and it wasn't given to the FBI. It was given to the Secret Service who wrote down exactly what she said and didn't change anything. So, very interesting stuff. Also, it seems very odd to me about this Dallas police car, number 207, showing up at uh, the rooming house while Oswald is changing his clothes. It pulls up, honks his horn twice. Erlene Robert glances out the window, sees the number on the cop car. Presumably, they see her looking out the window, and they leave. So we come back to right before this happened. Oswald gets dropped off, at least according to the cab records, somewhere in the vicinity of five to seven blocks past the rooming house. So maybe there was a cop car already there when he tried to go there and he told the cab driver, um, actually just, um, can you drop me off about five or seven blocks? Uh, keep, just keep going. I'll tell you when. This is good right here. This will work. So he gets out of the cab and he starts walking slowly towards the rooming house until he sees the cop car leave. So then he books ass, he gets down there, he goes into the rooming house. Maybe the cops went around the block looking and came back. This time they pull up in front of the rooming house while Lee Harvey, unbeknownst to them, Lee Harvey Oswald is in there changing clothes. They pull up, hit the horn twice. You know, Hawk Beak, Erlene Roberts peeking out through the curtains with her with her goggles on. Sees them, sees the car number. They get spooked and leave. And then we have Oswald waiting out front, supposedly near the bus stop on Zangs. Uh, interesting stuff. Interesting stuff to think about for sure. At least it's a tip of the hand that we know somebody on the Dallas police force knows where Oswald lives already by 1 p.m. A half an hour after President Kennedy shot. So now we have one of the first instances of uh, degradation towards Erlene Roberts. FBI memorandum, Dallas, Texas, March 18, 1964. On March 13, 1964, Mrs. Gladys Johnson of 1026 North Beckley advised she is the owner an operator of the rooming house at that address. She said she formerly employed Mrs. Erlene Roberts as a housekeeper at that address. He stated, however, that on Saturday night, March the 7th, 1964, Erlene Roberts packed her shit and left unexpectedly. He said she does not know how her present whereabouts are, but has talked to Erlene Roberts' sister, Bertha Cheek, who informed her that Erlene left her employment as a housekeeper because she was jealous 
of the attention that Mrs. Johnson paid to an elderly rumor on Mrs. Katie Gage. That seems like an odd reason to leave. And from what I understand, um, it was pretty much all males at these roomy houses. I mean, maybe there was a woman there named Katie Gage. I don't know. It seems odd to me. That's an odd statement. Odd statement. Oddly enough, there is an exhibit of the uh, envelope that the President's Commission on the Assassination of President Kennedy sent airmail to Mrs. Earlene Roberts, 1026 North Beckley, Dallas, Texas. It's postmarked March 27th, 1964. Somebody scratched off the address and wrote, don't live here. And stamped on the envelope is uh, 809 slash B, moved, left for no address. Interesting. Got a return to sender by April 3rd. Stamped on there as well. And on June the 11th, 1964, Mrs. Lance Johnson, owner 1026 North Beckley and proprietor of the rooming house located at that address, advised that Earlene Roberts was formerly employed by her as a housekeeper at that address and was so employed there on November the 21st, 1963. Mrs. Johnson related that Earlene Roberts is 59 years old, diabetic, fat, and has a low mentality. Further, she stated the only trip she knows early and Robert ever takes is to her doctor, which is also located in Dallas, Texas. Johnson advised she does not know where early and Roberts is pleasantly or presently employed. This was a deposition taken by Special Agent Switzer, like I said, on June 9th, 1964 in Dallas, Texas. So now the second... Uh, degradation of Earlene Roberts is she's fat, diabetic, and retarded. So <laughs> I don't know if this is all trying to discredit what Earlene Roberts has said about anything. It just seems odd behavior. I mean, I'm surprised they didn't try to say that she was an alcoholic as well or had severe mental issues, as is so often the case with a lot of these uh, people that they want to discredit um, in the eyes of the public. So, but I guess fat, obese, and retarded will work as well. So, so another way that these officers were possibly at 1026 North Beckley as early as they were. Um, you know was. Did Oswald tell them? And when did he tell them? So, according to um, James Hosty's handwritten contemporaneous notes, he writes, and thank you, Bart, bear-man.com, on 11-22, at 3.15 p.m., LHO was interviewed by Fritz, Bookout, and Captain somebody. I can't read it. Uh, LHO, first thing on here. LHO advised he resided at 1026 North Beckley under the name O.H. Lee, and he was employed with Texas, school, with Texas Book Depository. Now, that's the first thing on here. So if this is correct, um, 3.15 p.m., Oswald confirmed or told them that he resided at 1026 North Beckley. Okay? It's according to Hosty's handwritten notes. Now, 
We look over to Captain Will Fritz's handwritten notes. Okay. His also start off with 3.15 p.m. Okay. And he goes through, uh, didn't own a rifle, saw one at the building, Mr. Truly and two others, um, home, lab bus, change britches, something about Hosty going to Russia, admits uh, writing Russian embassy. Hansen Hosty says lived in Russia for three years. Da, 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 da. Something about Fort Worth to Marines says got usual medals, claims, no political beliefs, belongs to fair play for Cuba. Says supports Castro. Claims second floor Coke. When officer came in, the first floor had lunch out with Bill Shelley in front. Blah. Nothing on here. Nothing is on here. Fritz about living at 1026 North Beckley. Nothing. Now, something we learned from uh, Hosty's actual official. FBI uh, investigation memorandum from his interrogation of Oswald, which was done uh, which was dictated on November 23rd, 63. He states this right off the bat, Lee Harvey Oswald, 1026 North Beckley, Dallas, Texas was interviewed by Captain Will Fritz of the Homicide Bureau. Special agents Hosty and Bookout were present during this interview. When the agents entered the interview room at 3.15, Captain Fritz had been previously interviewing Oswald for an undetermined period of time. So apparently, according to them, they got there at 3.15 p.m. And by then, Fritz has already been talking to Oswald. Okay, so where is this information? Why is all of a sudden Lee Oswald admitting in the presence of Hosty and Bookout to living at 1026 North Beckley? Is this something he was confronted with by Will Fritz and said, okay, well, yeah, that's true. Um. So according to A.C. Johnson's warrants mission testimony, he says, well, they just came down there looking for Oswald. Beelan says, oh, did they say what his full name was? Johnson, yes, I believe they did. Lee Harvey Oswald, Mr. Johnson, I believe they did. Did they say how they happened to come there? Well... After he was uh, apprehended out there, they searched him and found my address in his pocket. Your address of 1026 North Beckley? Johnson says that's right. So, where is this scrap of paper with the 1026 North Beckley address on it? Never seen it. And the official stuff with Oswald, I mean, you know, when you search somebody, you, 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 they say you state exactly what you found. Um, you know, bus transfer, wallet contents, pocket contents. Uh, there is no scrap of paper in the official record that says 1026 North Beckley. So this is what they told A.C. Johnson um, as to how they came upon his address. Interesting. So, we're talking to Detective Bob Carroll, who uh, he grabbed Oswald's pistol and put it in his belt, and then he drove the car that carried Oswald back to City Hall. And Beelan says, did he give you his name? Carroll says, he gave the best I recall. 
I wasn't able to look closely, but the best I recall, he gave two names. I think I don't recall what the other one was. Did he give two names or did someone in the car read that from ID? Someone in the car may have read it from ID. I know two names, the best I recall, were mentioned. Were any addresses mentioned? Beryl says no, not South and Fall. Beelan, did you ever hear anyone say anything about having an address on North Beckley or on Beckley? Beryl says, I heard later, but I couldn't say it was who said it. When you say later, you mean later than what? Carol says later that day. Was this after you relinquished custody of Oswald? Yes. Up to that time, had you heard of it? Carol, I don't recall hearing it prior to the time I was in the city hall. Now, according to uh, Gus Rose, who was one of the first police officers to talk to Oswald when they arrived at the station. Ball says, did you ask him what his address was? Yes. But from there, he wouldn't tell me. He just said, you find out. Ball, now did anybody ever tell you his address was 1026 North Beckley? Rose says, later they did. Right then, they didn't. No, sir. Ball says, you didn't know it at that time. Rose, no, I did not. Now, Detective Richard Sims who also sat on in uh, Oswald's first interrogation that allegedly began at 2.20 p.m. as soon as he arrived, or shortly after arriving at the station. Ball, there was one time there that you learned that he had a room at 1026 North Beckley. When did you learn that? Sims, I don't know when that was now. That was found out the first day, I believe. Ball, can you tell me whether or not you were the one that found out he had a room at 1026 North Beckley? Sims says, no, sir, I didn't. Ball, he didn't tell you that? No, sir, I don't believe he did. Now, on that Friday afternoon, November 22nd, three Dallas police officers and three Dallas County Sheriff's deputies were dispatched to 2515 West 5th Street in Irving, Texas. Oswald had been arrested at about 1.50 p.m., arrived at City Hall a little after 2 p.m. and was taken into Captain Fritz's office at 2.20 p.m. Police officers at Damchick, Rose, and Stovall are unanimous in saying that Captain Fritz dispatched them to Irving at 2.30 p.m. They are also unanimous in saying that when they arrived at this address, they had to wait for 35 to 40 minutes for the deputy sheriffs to arrive since Irving was outside their jurisdiction. In his after-action report filed with Chief Curry, um, Gus Rose wrote that after the deputies showed up, they arrived at the front door at 3.30 p.m. Harry Weatherford, Buddy Walters, and J.L. Oxford were the deputies dispatched to Irving. You can find their accounts in the supplementary reports they filed with Cheryl Decker in Volume 19 of the Warren Commission hearings. Walters, Weatherford, and Decker all said that Ruth Payne gave them a telephone number where Oswald could be reached and that they crisscrossed that number and came up with the Beckley Street address. At 2.40 p.m., Potts, Single, and Cunningham were dispatched to 1026 North Beckley. Potts wrote in his after-action report that after he finished taking some affidavits, Fritz dispatched them to the Beckley Street address at 2.40 p.m., and they arrived at Beckley a little before 3. Detective Sinkle also said in his after-action report that they arrived at 1026 North Beckley a little before 3 p.m. Oh, so, folks... <laughs> Unless Oswald sang like a canary as soon as they had him in the interrogation room, which I doubt. Um, how in the hell did Fritz know where about to 1026 North Beckley? How? How did he know? It wasn't from Oswald because he didn't tell him. Okay? It wasn't from Ruth Payne and Marina because they didn't know. 
It wasn't from the Dallas County Sheriff's who didn't crisscross his information until after 3 p.m. Erlene Roberts didn't call Dallas police and say, hey, I see this guy's picture on TV. He lived here. That didn't happen. So how in the hell did Fritz know Oswald's rooming house address? They didn't get it from the FBI. They didn't know. They didn't get it from uh, the uh, job application from the school book depository or any of his co-workers because they didn't know about it. So how in the hell did Fritz know about this Beckley Street address? He didn't get it from Frazier. They didn't find Buell Wesley Frazier until almost 4 o'clock or 5 o'clock, 4 or 5 o'clock that Friday afternoon. And by then, there was already officers there. So how did he know? How did he know? Well, thankfully, the man himself was actually asked this by the Warren Commission. But what did he say? <laughs> so, Fritz is talking to Joseph Ball. And he says, when I started to talk to this prisoner, maybe just before I started talking to him, some officer told me outside my office that he had a room on Beckley. I don't know who that officer was. I think we can find out. I have, since I talked to you this morning, I have talked to Lieutenant Baker, and he says I know maybe who that officer was, but we're just not sure yet. Ball says, was there anything said about where he lived? Where he lived right at that time? Ball says, yes. Uh, Fritz, I am sure I had no way of asking him where he lived, but I'm not too sure about that. Uh, just how quick he told me because he corrected me. I thought he lived in Irving, and he told me he didn't live in Irving. He lived on Beckley, as the officer had told me outside. So, this is what he's saying. So, Oswald's interrogation began around 2.20. FBI agent Hosty, who may have gotten Oswald's phone number from Ruth Payne during one of these two visits, it allegedly occurred on November 1st and 5th. Could have crisscrossed the number earlier, did not arrive at police headquarters until 3.15 p.m. But by then, Will Fritz already had the Beckley address. Find the answer to who that officer was, who gave it to Fritz, and you might begin to learn. Who set Oswald up? I agree. I wholeheartedly agree. Now, Fritz never did supply this mysterious unknown officer who gave him this information, <laughs> shockingly enough. Um, but it's then started to believe that maybe, just maybe, somebody on the DPD was an undercover military intelligence officer and was fed this information from the 112th Intelligence Group. And here is why they think that possibly could be correct. Now, apparently when the officers first showed up at the rooming house, they were asking Earlene Roberts uh, about Harvey Lee Oswald. Harvey Lee Oswald. Not Lee Harvey Oswald. Harvey Lee Oswald. Now, remember when I told you that there were three Dallas County Sheriff deputies dispatched to Irving? Harry Weatherford, Buddy Walters, and J.L. Oxford. According to Harry Weatherford's supplementary investigation report filed on 11-23-63, he states, I stayed, I stayed with Mrs. Oswald and Mrs. Payne while the rest of the men searched the house. While standing near the phone bar, I saw a black telephone address book, which I picked up and thumbed through, finding the O's 
the name of Rihanna's wallet. And Texas School Book Depository and a phone number. And then another phone number, which I believe was written in pencil. I asked what this number was, pointing to the pencil number, and Mrs. Payne said that that is the phone where Lee was living. I gave this number to Buddy Walters and told him to call the sheriff and advise him of our findings that this was all fitting in together with the assassination of President Kennedy. Now, from Richard Stovall's Warren Commission testimony concerning a list of items taken out of 25 West 5th Street, I've got listed one blue telephone book, not black. Um, and according to Buddy Walter's supplementary investigation report, Mrs. Payne gave us a phone number and stated that was the number of Lee Oswald. However, she advised she did not know an address where he was staying. At this time, I called Sheriff Decker and advised him of this, and he crisscrossed the phone number and gave us an address of 1026 North Beckley. And he advised he would dispatch other officers to cover this address. In his Warren Commission testimony taken on July 23rd, however, Walters changes the scenario slightly. We didn't go to the trouble of looking at any of this stuff much, just more or less confiscated it at the time, and we looked at it there just like that. And then we took all this stuff and put it in the car, and then Mrs. Payne got a phone number from uh, uh, Mrs. Oswald where you could call Lee Harvey Oswald in Oak Cliff. And from Decker, we have Mrs. Payne gave Deputy Walters a telephone number where she said that Lee Oswald had been staying at. However, she stated that she did not know the address. Officer Walters then called me by public service, giving me this information, whereupon I had called Alan Sweat, Chief Criminal Deputy and Deputy Clint Lewis to locate the address by crisscross and also verifying the same through the telephone company. Mr. Sweat reported to me that the phone number was at 1026 North Beckley. At this time, I requested that Johnson, David Johnson, Justice of the Peace, to issue a search warrant to that location for officers to search the premises. Information was obtained at this address from the landlady to the effect that a man by the name of O.H. Lee had been living at this location for a period of two weeks. <laughs> and not, what was it, nine, ten weeks? Okay. So did Ruth Payne volunteer the number? Did Harry Weatherford find it? Did Ruth Payne get the number from Marina? So there's three different stories here from three different fucking people. It's like, it makes no sense. Alan Sweat makes no mention of this in his supplementary investigation report filed with Sheriff Decker on 11-23. J.L. Oxford, the other deputy present, his supplementary investigation report filed with Sheriff Decker makes no mention of Ruth Payne giving the police Oswald's phone number either. Also. They say they got the North, or that, that they got the Beckley Street phone number after the search of the Irving address was underway. However, police had been at the Beckley Street address for over 30 minutes by this team, like we talked about earlier. Dallas police had already been at the Beckley Street address for 30 to 40 minutes. So, what the fuck is going on here? Now, according to Ruth Payne's testimony, Mr. Jenner. Directing your attention to Commission Exhibit 402, which is your address book, is there anything on any of the entries which appear on those pages which relate to the Oswalds? Mr. Payne, the one on the left is the police officer who picked up the address book. Those are his initials and date that he picked it up. Mrs. Payne, I don't know who picked it up, and I didn't even notice that it was gone. So... She's saying she didn't give him the address book or the number. Which adds another layer to the story. <laughs> um, so back to Will Fritz's testimony before the Warren Commission. So some officer told you he thought this man had a room on Beckley? Yes, sir. Ball, had he been had he been brought into the station by that time? 
Fritz, he was at the station when, when we got there, you know. He was? Fritz, yes, sir. But then I talked to him and I asked him uh, where his room was on Beckley. Ball. Then you started to interrogate Oswald, did you? Yes, sir. Ball. And you called him into your room. Now, there was a weird thing called the Cozy Cozy 8 Apartments. They had an address with 1306 North Beckley. And some might have thought out there that it related to Gary Taylor's Warren Commission testimony that he thought Oswald was living at the Cozy 8 Apartments and old dyslexic Oswald screwed up the 1306 address into 3610 um, during the two weeks uh, from October 19th through November 3rd when Oswald went, quote, missing. So who in the hell knows? Um, but if anybody out there has any information on uh, how in the hell the Dallas police got this information about Oswald's rooming house before they should have known about it. <laughs> Holler at your boy and let me know. From Dallas, Texas, the flash... Of That's it this week. President Head to Twitter and TikTok at the Lone Gunman 7. Central Check out the Facebook page, the Lone Gunman Podcast, and the YouTube channel, the Lone Gunman Podcast. Make sure to like, subscribe, share, review, and rate. Your boy loves you. Happy Memorial Day, people. Go out and enjoy the weekend. Have some fun. Breathe in some fresh air. And memorialize those who have come before you. Peace.